Chapter Three of the Seven Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Three: A Merry Adventure. The snowplough had been along the wide street and the sidewalks of the main thoroughfares of the town, and the girls had no trouble at all in making headway through the residential and business paths of Sunnyside. But when they turned toward the hills on the west side of the village, they found that the snowploughs had not been so accommodating. Willow Bend Lane was covered with deep, soft snow, and when Bertha Angel, who chanced to be in lead, tried to stand on it, she sank down to her knees. Wading was out of the question. Willowbend Lane was on the outskirts of town, and it was a fully a mile back to the main road. They looked ahead of them across the unbroken snow to where, on a low hill, stood the big brownstone, turreted house in which lived the wealthy Miss Irving Earl Wright and her daughter, Rosamond. "'I wish you'd brought along some snowshoes,' Mary remarked. "'I hate to let a storm stump me. Brother will certainly tease us well if we go back without having reached our destination.' "'I don't think snowshoes would have helped us much,' Bertha Angel commented. "'It's quite a feat to walk on them until one gets on to the trick of it.' "'Hark ye!' Mary exclaimed, lifting a finger of her fur-lined glove. "'I hear sleigh bells. Somebody is coming. "'And if that somebody's destination happens to be up Willow Bend Lane, we'll beg a ride.' "'What if it's somebody we don't know?' Little Betty Bird ventured to inquire, to which Mary, "'How could it be? Wasn't I born here, and don't I know everybody within a million miles?' "'That sounds rather like hyperbole,' Bertha exclaimed. "'Like which?' Doris Drexel teased, and then added, "'Wouldn't Miss Preen be pleased to hear her prize pupil rattle off that fine-sounding word in "'Shh, shh!' Mary's hand was on Dory's arm. "'Our victim is now in sight.' "'My, what a swell turnout! Some cut of that, isn't it?' The six girls had stepped to one side of the road, and were watching with interest the approach of a large sleigh, which was being drawn at a rapid pace by two big white horses perfectly matched. The driver, as they could discern as it drew near, was a young man who was almost hidden in a big brown fur coat and cap. But his eyes were peering out, and he was amazed to see a bevy of girls standing by the unbroken lane, so evidently in distress. Stopping his horses, he snatched off his fur cap and revealed a frank, boyish face that had not been seen in that neighbourhood before. "'Young ladies,' he said courteously, "'can you direct me to the home of Colonel Wainwright? In the village they told me to follow this road a mile and ask someone which turn to take.' "'Oh, yes, we can tell you,' Mary replied. "'This lane is the shortcut to the Colonel's place.' The lad thanked her, and he was about to drive on. Then he hesitated and turned back. "'Young ladies,' he said, "'I have always told my sister never to ride with strangers, "'but if your destination is in this direction, "'I would be glad to convey you to it. "'I am Alfred Morrison of Dorchester.' "'Oh!' Mary exclaimed brightly. "'My brother, Jack Lee, is acquainted with you, I am sure. "'He goes to school in the city.' "'The boy's good-looking face plainly showed his pleasure. "'Indeed I know old Jack well,' he exclaimed. "'We're doing college prep work together. "'I planned looking you up as soon as I had finished my business call on the Colonel.' Feeling sure that their mothers could not object, since the strange boy was so well acquainted with Mary's brother, they swarmed onto the luxurious sleigh, sitting three deep, which but added to their gaiety. The horses were obliged to travel slowly through the drifts, but they soon came to the part of the lane where the wind had blown the snow from the road to be caught at the fences, and then they made a better time. In a very few moments the sleigh was turning in between two high stone gate posts, as Mary had directed, and shortly thereafter the six girls were tumbling out and for a wide sheltering portico. "'We're terribly grateful to you, Mr. Morrison,' Mary exclaimed. "'Maybe we'll be able to pick you up at some time when you're stranded somewhere.' The boy laughed good-naturedly. "'I hope I won't have that long to wait before I can see you all again.' he included the group in his smiling glance then because the spirited horses were restive he lifted his fur cap and turned his attention towards the prancing span laughingly the girls climbed up the stone steps and were about to ring the bell when the door was thrown open and their prettiest member as rose was often called welcomed them effusively say but you missed the time of your young life peggy pierce informed her as the girls removed their overshoes and leggings in the storm vestibule such a handsome boy as we had drive us up the lane oh you don't have to tell me rose laughingly replied i was standing in the drawing-room window watching you from the time you appeared at the foot of the lane if you had turned back i should have been simply heartbroken 
Mother thinks that I have a cold, and she won't let Tony drive me to town, and, of course, I can't use my runabout in weather like this. Then, when cloaks and caps had been removed, and they were gathered about the wide fireplace in Rose's very own sitting-room, that maiden passed around a five-pound box of chocolates to keep the first part of her promise. Then she demanded, "'Mary Lee, you haven't told the others your exciting news yet, have you?' Bertha Angel answered for their president. "'Nary an inkling of it. To tell truth, we didn't even ask her. I guess we all thought we'd rather wait until the meeting was called.' "'Oh, I say, let's cut out formality for once, can't we?' Peggy Pierce implored. "'Why read the minutes of the last meeting when all we did was entertain the little orphans at the big Christmas tree?' "'All?' Gertrude West lifted her eyebrows questioningly. I believe, if you left it to the orphans, they would tell you that we did a whole lot to add to their Christmas cheer. Sure thing we did. I'll acknowledge that, but... Come to order, if you please. The President tapped on the arm of her chair, which was upholstered in rose-coloured brocade, as were the other chairs and the gilt-framed sofa piled high with silken pillows. We'll omit reading the minutes, because we mustn't stay long. It gets dark so early this month, and we'll have to wade back through the lane and we won't call the roll, because, of course, we know that we are all here. So, since I believe you are properly curious, I will now tell you my news item. I, Mary and Margaret Lee, have discovered the meaning of the letters CDC, and, what is more, I now know what the boys do at their secret meetings. Mary, do you really? How did you ever find out? I've asked Bob over and over to tell me, but he has always refused and has actually declared that we girls would never know. Well, their president said, we do know, at least in part, I hate eavesdropping as much as anyone, but when Jack himself shut me in the stuffy little room of the library where we store our old magazines and books, and where I had gone to hunt up an article I needed for composition, how could I help hearing? Two or three of their CDC club had come along for a special session, I guess. I was just about to burst out when I heard Jack say, yes, we're alone, all right, Sis went to the library, I think to do some reference work. Then, before I could really do anything, I was so wedged in among piles of magazines, Jack had announced, Stay fellows, but I'd got the keenest Conan Doyle book ever. Best ever, I call it. Mary paused and looked around the group, her eyes sparkling triumph. For a moment there was silence, and then, with a wild Indianish whoop, Peggy, her dark face glowing, cried gleefully, I tumble. After glancing about at the others, who were looking rather more puzzled than intelligent, Peg demanded, "'Don't any of you get what Mary is driving at? Bertha, you surely know what the boys mean by their CDC?' "'Of course. How beautifully stupid we are,' Bertha acknowledged. "'The Conan Doyle Club. Oh, wouldn't the boys rage and tear at their hair if they knew we'd even guessed at that much?' But it was quite plain to the group that Mary had still more to divulge. "'Who is Conan Doyle, anyway?' the youngest asked. "'What kind of books did he write?' "'My child,' said Bertha condescendingly, "'hast never heard of Sherlock Holmes, the great detective?' "'Oh, of course I have,' Betty Bird replied. "'Then the boys have a detective club. Is that it, Mary?' The girl addressed finished eating an especially big oozy chocolate before she noddingly replied. "'That's it, all right. I gathered from the little I heard that each member of the club wants to become a detective, when he is a man of estate, and the things they do at their club is take turns in making up a mystery, and the other boys have to try and solve it. "'Say, what fun that would be! I wish they would let girls join their club,' Doris Drexel remarked, but Mary put in. "'Oh, you wouldn't wish it, young lady, if you knew, as I do, how little they think of our intelligences.' One of them, I couldn't tell which, had written to a lawyer uncle in New York, telling about their club, and in reply their uncle had told about some young woman detective in his employ, and how clever she was. At which Jack sniffed, well, she must be an exception, all right. I can't imagine my sister Mary, or any of her crowd, solving a mystery, not if the clues were spread out in front of them. Bob laughed at that in his good-natured way, and replied that there wasn't much danger of anyone getting a chance to solve a mystery in this little lakeside town, when nothing ever happened that was in the least unusual. Then he said, that's why we have to make up our own mysteries, since we can't unearth any real ones to practice on. All the while that Mary had been talking, Peg had been sitting on the edge of her chair, looking as though she would burst if she didn't soon get a chance to say what was on her mind. The moment their president paused, she leaped in with, "'Girls, I thought of the most scrumbunctious idea. 
Let's have a detective club of our own, and let's find a real mystery to solve and show those boys a thing or two. Won't they be humiliated good and proper when they learn that we, seven mere girls without intelligence, have solved the greatest mystery that ever occurred in the village of Sunnyside? Hold on, Peg. Your imagination is running away with you. Anyone would think you've already found the mystery to solve. I'm of the opinion that Jack is right, or Bob, whoever said it, that there is never anything mysterious happening in this sleepy, quiet old town. And if there isn't, how, pray, can we solve it? Bertha was always logical and practical. Their balance wheel, she was sometimes called. I bet you I find a mystery. Peg stood up as though she were going to start out on the search. I've always been wild about mystery stories, read every one at the library, and I'll know just how to go about solving one, when it's found. Sit down, friend sleuth, and tell us your plan. There are possibilities in it, I agree. Mary smiled up into the olive face of the most energetic member, as she continued reminiscently. In the beginning we named our club the SSC, because we lived in Sunnyside. Then we gradually added a second meaning to please our saintly Gertrude. You're a tease. The sweet-faced girl, their minister's daughter, smiled lovingly at the speaker, who continued as though unconscious of the interruption, which was Spread Sunshine Club. We proceeded to sew for missionary barrels, so heaven help the heathen who had to wear the clothes I made if they care anything about a stylish fit. A burst of merry laughter proved that her listeners were recalling some garment made by their president that had not come up to set specification. Then we decided to centre our spreading sunshine efforts on our home orphanage. Shh, don't say anything, Trudy. I know we've done nobly and all that, but now I feel about the way Peg does, that if we keep on being so saintly, I'll be drawn up heavenward before I have a real fling. So what I am going to suggest is that we add a third meaning to our club letters, which shall be... Oh, Madam President, may I say what? Peggy was again on the edge of her chair, waving a frantic hand as though she was a child in school. Sure thing. Shoot. How would Seventh Sleuths Club do for the new meaning? Actually inspired, I should say. Now, all that is left to find is a mystery to solve. Peggy Pierce, I appoint you and your twin friend Doris Drexel, a committee of two, to find a mystery before our next meeting, which is to be held at Bertha Angel's home one week from today. If by that time you have failed, I will appoint... Fail? Dory and I don't know the meaning of the word, that slender maid retorted. Bertha, who was nearest the window, then exclaimed, "'Someone is driving in. Why, if it isn't that nice Alfred Morrison!' "'Great,' Mary declared. "'Now we can get a ride out of the lane. I do believe that is why he is coming.' And she was right. Rose answered the door before a maid could appear, and the youth, cap in hand, informed her that he had happened to think that since the young ladies had no way to get to the lane, perhaps they had no way to get out.' Rose replied in her pretty manner that she knew the girls would be glad to go with him. Then she invited him in to have a cup of hot chocolate, which, even then, a maid was passing to the club members, having been told to appear at that particular hour. Without the least sign of embarrassment, the boy joined the girls in the cosy little sitting room off the big library, and drank a cup of hot chocolate as though he really enjoyed it. Half an hour later, as the sun was setting, Mary said with apparent solemnity, "'Now we will adjourn the meeting.' which I believe has been most satisfactory, and let me urge each and every one of our members to remember that all that has passed today is most secret, and no matter how the boys of the CDC might pry, not an inkling of what has occurred here is to be divulged to them. Then, twinkling-eyed, she changed her tone to one more natural. Won't they have the surprise of their young lives, though, if we do succeed? No ifs, Peg interjected with determination. We will. End of chapter 3